today on Main Street Living. Another year is quickly drawing to a close and Christmas is over. The gifts have been opened, the food is gone, the company has gone home, the celebrations leave us wanting peace and quiet. But like dried up needles dropping off of our Christmas tree, many people struggle with this post-holiday blahs. And I wonder, did Mary and Joseph feel the same way? After the hubbub of the travel to Bethlehem with the pregnant wife, no place to rest, and all of those visitors, Joseph was probably wondering if anything could get worse. And it did. In this first Sunday after Christmas, we're faced with a very strange story. We don't want to hear it as part of the Christmas story. It's called the slaughter of the innocent. Who wants to hear about killing babies? The worship service will begin after opening hymn. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ, given to die for us, and for His sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, He gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them His Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Old Testament lesson for the first Sunday after Christmas comes to us from the prophet Isaiah Chapter 63, I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to that all that the Lord has granted us, and the great goodness of the house of Israel, that he has granted them according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he said, Surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. And he became their Savior, and in all of their affliction he was afflicted, and the angels of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. 
but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore he, will, he turned to be their enemy, and he himself fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old of Moses and his people, where he is who brought them out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock. Where is he who put them in the midst of his Holy Spirit, who caused his glorious arm to be at the right hand of Moses, who divided the waters before them to make for him an everlasting name, who led them through the depths. Like a horse in the desert, they did not stumble. Like the livestock, they go down into the valley. The Spirit of the Lord gave them rest. So you led them, your people to make yourself a glorious name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is, comes to us from St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, the fourth chapter. He writes, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent his, spirit, his uh, Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord according to St. Matthew, chapter 2. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then when Herod, when, then when Herod he saw that he had then been tricked by the wise men, became furious and he sent and, and killed all the male children in Bethlehem in all of the region who were two, two years old and under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in the city of Nazareth, so that when was spoken by the prophet might be fulfilled, that he would be called the Nazarene. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Grace to you and peace from our God and our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for my message today is from the Gospel lesson, Matthew chapter 2. Another year is quickly drawing to a close and Christmas is over. The gifts have been opened, the food is gone, the company has gone home, the celebrations leave us wanting peace and quiet. But like dried up needles dropping off of our Christmas tree, many people struggle with this post-holiday blahs. And I wonder, did Mary and Joseph feel the same way? After the hubbub of the travel to Bethlehem with the pregnant wife, no place to rest, and all of those visitors, Joseph was probably wondering if anything could get worse. And it did. In this first Sunday after Christmas, we're faced with a very strange story. We don't want to hear it as part of the Christmas story. It's called the slaughter of the innocent. Who wants to hear about killing babies? We've never seen this on Christmas cards, and no Christmas carols say anything about killing innocent two-year-old boys. Our children's Christmas programs always cut short the story after the Magi, but right smack dab in the middle of Matthew's incarnation account, he describes a most violent event. But why did Matthew include it? It's an essential part of our Christmas story. Did you notice that God didn't allow his holy family to stay in a quiet life in Bethlehem? The baby they were raising was the very Son of God, the Savior of the world. And from his incarnation forward, Satan and the world tried to get rid of the Messiah. But Mary and Joseph were under God's witness protection plan. They'd eventually go back and to their tiny hometown. And in these events, from his birth forward, God, through St. Matthew, connects the dots on the prophecies of the Messiah. The story of Jesus as the fulfillment of every prophecy to the evidence of his suffering and death for our salvation began to unfold. What happens next? God answers that question. He'll show us how that virgin birth, the Magi's visit, the flight to Egypt are all historical markers that Jesus followed on his path to give us life when he became to be our Savior. We can't fully grasp Matthew's story without first knowing this Old Testament prophecy. Matthew recalls these minute details to show without a question that within the incredible depth and richness of the Christmas story, the gospel of Christ is firmly found in the fertile soil of Old Testament prophecy. The loving picture of Jesus in the manger is a heartwarming, but the reality of Christmas is that this newborn child will be a savior who would die for our sins. But while included in this innocent story, we don't want to sing about it. We don't, it's not about the children's Christmas pageants. Maybe it's because we want to stay home the first Sunday after Christmas and pretend that there's no letdown after Christmas. But maybe because there are horrible things that are happening in our own world. Maybe we just want to forget the real world. Maybe we'd rather want everything in this world to be like that peaceful, silent night that we sang on Christmas Eve. And isn't that really easier? Why can't Christmas, and every day for that matter, be just sweetness and joy and love? Well, here's the answer why. An angel of the Lord came to Joseph in the dream. Get up, take the child and his mother to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Not long before the Magi came to visit Jesus, they told Herod they came to see the one that was born the king of the Jews. Herod was the king. He didn't want a newborn child to take his throne. So when the Magi didn't return, Herod knew that he was tricked. Any threat to his position had, been, had to be eliminated. So he sent soldiers into Bethlehem to kill all the boys under the age of two. But God had a greater plan. No one can stop God's plan of our salvation. It was Satan's first attempt to eliminate Christ. But Joseph took Jesus and Mary to their place in Egypt where they stayed until Herod died. Do you see what happened? Satan failed and prophecy was fulfilled. What the Lord said through his prophet came true. Out of Egypt I called my son. 
Through the gospel, the Holy Spirit reveals that this applies to Jesus. Just as God called the nation of Israel out of Egypt, so also God called his son Jesus out of Egypt. So when King Herod died and an angel told Joseph it was safe for him to take his family back to Israel, what else could go wrong? Well, Herod's son Archelaus was placed as king. He was worse than his father. So now what? Joseph was warned in, a, warned in a dream to leave and move to Nazareth in Galilee. Do you see what just happened? Satan tried, Satan failed, and the Messiah is safe and prophecy is fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. A Nazarene, a despised person from a small town in the middle of nowhere. But even though Satan would try time after time, his plans didn't work. But God in Christ always prevails. Isn't that just like today? Right after Christmas, it seems the devil works hard to bring us down. He'd love to, for us to pack up our decorations along with our Christmas joy. And he wants to, us to hear, you can stop being religious now because Christmas is over. His attacks can make us depressed. He'd, re he'd revel at the chance to make our Christmas joy of God with us disappear like a wrapping paper. Satan will subtly attack even those that are inside of the church. Remember the old hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing? It was written by Robert Robinson back when he was about 23 years old. In the third verse it reads, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel. Prone to leave the God I love. Later on, Robinson fell away from his Christian faith. He once heard a woman hum this in, at him as they were traveling together, and she eventually asked him what he thought of that hymn. And Robinson replied, Madam, I am, a, I am the poor, unhappy man who wrote that hymn. I would give a thousand worlds if I had those words in my heart, still just to enjoy the feeling I had back then. Some 30 years after the Magi visited Jesus, Jesus didn't flee. He freely offered himself to be crucified for the death of our sins deserving. It wasn't the angry crowd. It wasn't Pilate. It wasn't King Herod that made all of that happen. God, the Father of grace and mercy, placed our punishment on Jesus. But even on Calvary's hill, Satan thought that he had won, but he failed, and the greatest prophecy ever was fulfilled. All of our sins, original and committed, all were washed away by Christ on the cross. But that's why Jesus was born. Jesus, Satan tries to mess up our faith in life, but, the, but he always fails because the prophecy of everything in Christ accomplished for our life and salvation is certain and awaiting that day when we will live in that final prophecy of life everlasting in his kingdom. That's what brings us Christmas joy. That's what keeps us alive along after Christmas lights are taken down. These verses are for us today are vital to fully embrace that victory that Jesus won for us, for you and me by his death on the cross and by his glorious resurrection. That's why we celebrate Christmas every day, the way Jesus made it, paid for it, just for you. Amen. And now may the peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen.
We ask that you pray for God's continued blessing upon this program and please consider giving a gift to support this ministry and keep it on the air so that many others may know God's saving grace for them. You may send your gift to this address, Main Street Living, 1400 South Duluth Avenue, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 57105. Tune in again next week to Main Street Living. And until then, remember that God loves you so very much and that His grace, God's riches at Christ's expense, is something you can count on every day of your life.